Welcome. At Memorial, we want to do two things. Learn to know and follow Christ and invite others to do the same. What we mean by that is we want everyone to become all that God intends for them to become and not settle for anything less. Our hope is that everyone feels that our church is a place where you can come and belong. Welcome to the worship service this morning. We are so glad you're here, and may God receive all the glory as we worship together. In the vast tapestry of existence, life unfolds in mysterious ways. From the moment we draw our first breath to the final beat of our hearts, each journey is unique, a fleeting dance in the cosmic ballet. Time, relentless and impartial, sweeps all into its embrace. Every soul, every story, converges towards a shared destiny, the inevitable passage into the great unknown. Yet, amid the silent echoes of mortality, a singular tale emerges. In the quiet dawn of history, a man named Jesus defied the natural order. His crucifixion echoed the fate of many, but his story took an unexpected turn. On the third day, against the backdrop of despair, hope rose. Jesus once laid in a cold tomb, defied the shadows. The stone rolled away, and life triumphed over death. In this symphony of existence, where every note resonates with mortality, one melody endures, a melody of hope. For Jesus, the embodiment of divine love, emerged from the darkness, offering a promise that transcends the boundaries of time. In the hope of Jesus, we find a timeless beacon, reminding us that even in the face of mortality, the spirit can rise and life can be reborn. The crucible of despair transforms into a canvas painted with the colors of resurrection. And in the whispers of grace, we discover the eternal promise of renewal. Well, I too want to welcome you to our Easter service. My name is Pastor Jeff. I'm one of the pastors here as well. And we're so glad that you are here with us to celebrate a risen Savior together. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Lord, we ask that this message be your message. Lord, we ask that you bless our time in the Word. We're thankful that we can sing about a risen Savior. That Jesus did not remain in the grave, and we praise you for that. Jesus, we are so thankful for your sacrifice, your love that was shown on the cross, and your power that was shown in the resurrection. And we celebrate that today together, and we are so thankful for the love that you have for us. In Jesus' name, amen. The question was asked, do you believe in the resurrection from the dead? That was a question that was asked by a boss of one of his employees, who the previous week asked for some time off for his grandmother's funeral. Um, the young man responded a little confused by the question and said, well, yes, I do. And the boss responded, responded interesting, uh, because when you left work yesterday, your grandmother came to visit you. <laughs> this is Resurrection Sunday, and the word resurrected can be used in a number of ways. Um, outside of Easter Sunday, we can hear it in normal conversation when someone might say that uh, a, an, an actor whose career has been resurrected, like that young boy on Indiana Jones who is now a star in Hollywood once again. 
or that golfer that won last week and who hadn't won in nine years. They resurrected their career. It could be a struggling artist, a chef, a business executive who is suddenly at the top. Uh, other uses of the word resurrected could be just simply a memory that comes to mind. Uh, something that caused you to have something resurrected in your mind. But it's Easter. We are not talking about a golfer or an actor that bursts back onto the scene or recalling a favorite memory when you have a familiar scent or even a poorly framed joke. We are talking about death to life. So do you believe in the resurrection? Because if we believe what, we, what Easter is all about, that Jesus truly raised from the dead, it would completely change your life. It would take you from death to life. So turn with me to Romans chapter 6. And we will discuss today the historical events that separates Christianity from all other religions of the world and how the resurrection can cause you to be new and free and alive. And we will begin with being made new. So as we turn together to Romans chapter 6, Romans is the sixth book in your New Testament. And we'll start by reading the first four verses as we discover how God can make us new. Verse 1, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. General James Oglethorpe was the founder of the colony of Georgia. He was a visionary, a social reformer, a military leader in the early 1700s. He was having a conversation with a pastor named John Wesley, and he said these words, I never forgive, and I never forget. To which Wesley replied, Then, sir, I hope you never sin." See, there must be a point in everyone's life where you recognize in your heart of hearts that you are a sinner. Whether it's in, in thought or word or deed, everyone here, everyone could say that, that they have done something wrong in their lives. And when your heart is gripped by the weight of sin, you realize that you cannot carry that burden all the way through eternity. Listen, if I asked you to move a car for me in the parking lot, it was, it was blocking the way, and I just said, hey, hey, can you go move that car for me? Most of you would say, I, gladly, yes, I will move that for you. Uh, can I have the keys? And if I said, I don't have the keys, you're going to have to move it by hand. Most of you would look at me in a, a bewilderment, like, how in the world? That's impossible. Uh, no one could move a car by hand. No one has that ability. And the same could be said about your sins. Uh, you cannot move them by yourself. And the key that you need is the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And only through Jesus can your sins be forgiven, through His death and resurrection. It's like a fresh coat of paint that covers our sins. Because in, in Isaiah 43, it actually says those words. God is the one who blots out our sins and then will remember them no more. So verse 1, though, a piggybacks on that and, and basically says, okay, if that's true, does that mean after we paint a wall, we can just mark up the walls or give a, a child a Crayola box and let them go wild? Just because we know that we have that coat of paint ready. No. Just because your sins may be covered, we do not simply live like the world. Just because we know that God will forgive our sins, we don't do anything we want. See, no loving parent would allow their child, after they just asked forgiveness for a certain behavior, to just go and do it again. That's not God's intention 
of his forgiveness of our sins. On Good Friday, we remember the death of Jesus Christ being nailed to the cross to die for our sins. And when we choose to follow Christ, it comes with an understanding that, that when Jesus died on the cross, he also defeated sin. And so with Jesus in your life, you have, with the resurrection, have defeated sin and have defeated death. Sin has been put to death in your life. And the question that we see in these, this passage, just as we read it, then, then how, then how could you live in your sin? Because of Jesus, the, the punishment for your sins, if you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, is no longer on your record. Eternity separated for God, from God. That is the punishment for sins. And if you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, He will give you new life, and that new life is eternal life. And that's a life that is something we should never take for granted. It should inspire our hearts and our souls with the desire to, to live a life that is pleasing to the Lord and our response to His grace to us. And if we respond in that way and, and ask forgiveness of our sins and repent and, 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 and ask God to save us, He will give us new life. That's what verses 3 and 4 tell us. And if you abandon your old life, that's the whole point of, of repentance, is turning from your old life and turning towards a new life that is in Christ. When you do that, you walk in a newness of life. I love how Paul puts it. A newness of life. It's better than the feeling when you walk off the plane on, onto a Caribbean island on your vacation in December. It's a better feeling than when you filled out that last question on the final exam. It's a better feeling than when you hit the pillow after a very long, hard work day of work. It's better than all of those. Because everything that I mentioned is temporary. And it's even more than a feeling. It is a, a complete transformation of your soul, and it is forever. After your sins are forgiven and you trust in Jesus Christ, you are made new. You have new life. That is what we are celebrating today. Jesus in new, gives you new life through Him because He raised from the dead. Now you might be here on Easter and just still not sure about this you are still not quite convinced that the resurrection happened. What might help you to know that there is historical documentation that, that Jesus did raise from the dead. Of course, we have Scripture, we have the Gospels, we have New Testament writings. You say, that, well, that's kind of circular reasoning. Well, there's even re references by non-Christian historians like Josephus and Tacitus. Tacitus, there it is. See, did you deny the existence of Alexander the Great? Do you deny the existence of Napoleon? Those are also in historical records. Then why do you deny that Jesus lived and died and rose again? There was also the many witnesses of Jesus being alive. We see Mary and the other women. We see over 500 witnesses according to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. There is the significance of the witness of the disciples. Why is that significant? Because if you know your gospel account, you know what happened after the death of Jesus Christ. They were cowering. They were shivering in their sandals behind locked door. Until what? until they saw Jesus was alive, and then they were willing to literally give their lives to that truth. Another significance as well, a potential convincing argument for the resurrection is the new life that you could have in Jesus Christ. That you could experience that, that, that you could go from, from death to life. That, that same thing could happen in your life. That's what Romans 6 is telling you, that you could also experience a, a resurrection. You could go from death to life, a soul resurrection. That could be you today. If you've never experienced the newness of life that is described here, the Bible says that you are still dead in your sins. 
And you are dragging with the chains of your fears, your transgressions, your worries, your pain, and you have to carry that every day of your life. Hear this. Jesus' death and resurrection could change all of that for you. Not worrying in this life of what is next. Your sins can be forgiven. Your worries about tomorrow are shot to the moon. And your pain can find comfort in a loving Heavenly Father. That's what this new life is like. It's not that becoming a Christian makes your life perfect, that you never struggle, that you never have difficulty, that you never sin. I'm not saying that, but I am saying that you have newness of life. You have eternal life to look forward to. Because it's not just for a day. As God's Word tells us right here, that you get to walk in it. That every step you take in the valleys and in the mountaintops of life, you are walking in newness of life. Romans 6 also tells us that we are free in Jesus Christ. Verse 5 through 8. Verse 5 tells us this, For if we have been united with Him in a death like His, we shall certainly be reunited with Him in a resurrection like His. We know that our old self was crucified with Him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with Him. This is, of course, talking about Jesus' death and resurrection and then how that applies to our lives. But first, in order to understand this, we need to go to the historical account of Jesus' resurrection, and that is found in John chapter 19. John being the fourth gospel in your New Testament. So Jesus' death and resurrection was described here. John chapter 19, and then we'll go to 20. John chapter 19, verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all was now finished, said, to fulfill the scripture, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there so that they put a, a, a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was a day of preparation and so that the bodies would not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath was a high day, the Jews asked Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. So the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. But one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once came out blood and water. And he saw, it was born witness, his testimony is true. And he knows that he is telling the truth, that you also may believe. For these things took place, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Not one of his bones will be broken. And again, another scripture says, they will look on him when they have pierced. Verse 38, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who had, was a disciple of Jesus, was, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took away the body. Nicodemus also, who, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight, and they took the body of Jesus and bound it in linen clothes with the spices as of the burial custom of the Jews. Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. In the garden, a new tomb in which no one had been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was closed at hand, they laid Jesus there. Jesus died and he was buried. There was proof of his death. His side was pierced. He was prepared for burial. Matthew chapter 27, verse 60 tells us that a stone was rolled in front of the tomb. There was finality there. Jesus died on the cross. There was physical actions that proved it. The side being pierced, his body was wrapped. The Roman government governor gave permission for Jesus' body to be given for burial. The tomb was sealed with a gigantic stone. See, at this point of the story, hope is pretty much lost for his followers. The, the rabbi, the, the Messiah that they were following had died. 
And for them, hope was gone. This may be why some of you are here today. For you, that would describe you. you hope seems lost for you. You don't have that joy. You've tried everything to, to fill your heart with joy, you, you, to provide hope in the morning, to provide peace so you can lay down and rest at night. You have not found that. It seems like that, that the hope and the joy and the peace have been buried in the ground like, like the body of Jesus. But listen to me. Easter presents you with joy and hope and peace. The risen Savior presents all of that in your life. If you would only take it. Because in John chapter 20, verses 1 and 10, we find that Jesus rose from the dead. John chapter 20, verse 1. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been rolling away, rolled, taken away from the stone. The stone tomb. There we go. So she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said to them, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb. We do not know where they have laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going toward the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. And stooping to look in, he saw the linen clothes lying there, but he did not go in. And Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb. He saw the linen clothes lying there and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, not lying with the linen clothes, but folded up in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and believed, for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to their homes. Jesus rose from the dead. See, the grave could not hold the Savior. This is significant on multiple levels. I want to ask you this. Has, has anyone seen the, the underwater caves? Have you, have you gone to YouTube and watched these uh, underwater divers go through these caves? And, and they're not sure what happens next. They, they go through these. They're exploring. Uh, there's, there's these tight spaces that they go through in water and they go under caves and they're not sure if they're going to get out on the other side. Um, here's the deal. I, if if I, someone asked me to do that with them, I would say, you can go first <laughs> and, and you can explore the cave. It sounds like you like to do that anyway because you're an explorer. Go and do that and, and build that rope thingy and bring that rope out to wherever you go and make sure it gets to this nice oasis where you think there is at the end of the caves. Take some pictures in your underwater, uh, underwater cameras, all those things, right? And then come back to me, show me the pictures, and then put me down as a maybe. <laughs> After all that, right? Because here's what you want. Maybe some of you are explorers and you would raise your hand. And you're like, sign me up for that. Get me in the tight spaces and the uh, exploration of the caves, even though you don't know what's next. Maybe that's you. But here's what I would want. I would want someone to experience that for me, before me, and then come back and tell me about it. See, Jesus experienced death before we did. And he is telling us that and experienced it for us, and he defeated it. So that if you would trust in him as your Savior, because Jesus experienced death and he defeated death, that can now happen in your life. That's what Romans 6 is telling us. That you can experience a resurrection because Jesus went through all of that for you, before you. And he's telling you about it through Scripture. That someday we will face our ending fate. Now we can have faith that, that God has power over life after death. And you too do not have to remain in that grave if you have life in Jesus Christ. It proves who Jesus says He is. The Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Son of God. Okay, let's make a return trip to Romans chapter 6.
So yes, Jesus' death did happen. Yes, Jesus' resurrection did happen. Now, it kind of turns on us and says we, can, we too can experience His resurrection. So what about our death? What about our resurrection? First, our death. When we believe in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross and put our trust in Him, our old self also dies on that cross. And there is, there's no mourning for, for the old self because of what the new self presents to us. What God would give to us through Jesus Christ is exceedingly superior. I know those two words are the same, but I wanted to say them both. Because you want to, to put your old self as far away from you as possible. All the pre-redeemed contents of that old self like an old toxic relationship, an expired jug of milk, a used band-aid. Those are the types of illustrations I want to use to push that old self as far away from you as possible. You say, that, well, that's pretty harsh, describing a pre-Christian version of myself. What I am saying, and what I want to emphasize really, is that your life in Christ is that good compared to what it was. See, our resurrection, yes, there is a promise of resurrection for all that believe. But in this present life, there can also be a resurrection of, of old life to new. From, from death and your sins to new, newness of life in Jesus Christ. To be raised in new life in Jesus. And when that happens, your eternity actually begins. Your eternal birth certificate begins on the day that you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. Because you will forever be a child of God and nothing and nothing and nothing can take that away. But we also experience freedom in life. And that's what we see in verses 7 and 8. See, our sinful decisions are a result from what is in our heart. And if our hearts are changed by Jesus Christ, then, then the epicenter of for sin has a, a new supervisor, a, a new driver for your thought and your words and your deeds. A while ago, a Gabriel Rule tells a story about a stagecoach company. Um, before we had automobiles, they were hiring those that would drive these stagecoaches on, on really dangerous cliffs up, up mountains. And, and they had to have a certain ability to be able to drive these. So he was interviewing potential drivers. And he would ask the one main question to the drivers that were applying for this job. He would ask them, how close will you take the stagecoach to the edge of the cliff? How close can you get with a, without, of course, tipping it over? First applicant came in and said, well, I think I can actually get three feet. I can get up to three feet next to that edge of the cliff. And the guy interviewing said, thank you. Uh, you are dismissed. And then and the second person, second person came in, asked the same question. How close can you get to the edge of the cliff without falling over? And he said, you know what? I can get one foot. And he said, you know what? Thank you. You are dismissed. Third applicant came in. Ask the same question, how close can you get as you drive the stagecoach to the edge of the cliff? And the man said, as far away as possible. And he said, you're hired. <laughs> we'll explain later. Listen, you still have to, to live in this world, a, a world that is full of, of wickedness and evil and sin, and you and Jesus Christ have a new driver of your heart. And that new driver of your heart wants you to be as far away as possible from sin. And not to get as close as you can, but be as far away. Jesus becomes your new boss, your new supervisor, your new driver. He is your guide, your mediator, and example. Jesus, who was willing to die to cleanse you from your sin, also wants to keep you as far away from sin as possible because he know that, knows that he will damage your life. 
You've been given in Jesus Christ a new heart, a new mind. You are a new creature in Jesus. And that freedom and that life that Jesus gives you is through the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. You have new freedom because sin is no longer your boss. See, your old boss was telling you things to do wrong. It was telling you to take the wrong path, the wrong relationships, the wrong reactions, the wrong vices in your life. And now you can listen to a, a new boss who will give you the freedom to do what is right. Which boss would you rather have? Because with Jesus, your desires begin to change for something greater. Something bigger than yourself. Bigger than this world that we live in. You begin to, to live for what will last forever. Your life now will have a greater purpose with Jesus Christ. And finally, with that, you are made alive. That's in verses 9 through 11 in Romans 6. Let's read that. It says this, We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will, no, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you must also consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. See, when your debt is paid, whether it's a credit card bill, whether it's your school bill, whether it is a bill at McDonald's, one thing that is not going to happen when you pay that bill is they are not going to ask you to pay it again. Well, most likely, right? <laughs> no, it's been paid. And, and you have a receipt See, the Bible tells us that Jesus died once for all. He paid the debt. It no longer needs to be paid. Jesus will never go to the cross again. He will never go to the tomb again. He will never have to die again. It has been paid in full. Jesus died once for all. And if you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, your debt will be paid forever. So you see, when you were born, we were born, we were born in debt. And no, I'm not talking about dollars and cents. I'm talking about sin and unforgiveness. You have a debt that cannot be paid by yourself, by anything in your possession. No, um, no money, no amount of good works, no amount of charitable giving can make up the chasm that is between you and a holy God. So if you cannot pay it, then your only hope is for someone to pay it for you. And that person is Jesus Christ. He paid the penalty, the ransom, the debt that, that resulted from your sin on that cross. And it is paid in full. But you still have to believe. You still have to place your faith in Jesus Christ. You still have to give your life over to Jesus you still have to ask forgiveness to save you, to completely trust Jesus with your eternal life, to save your soul. You still have to do that. And the receipt is the Holy Spirit. Proof that Jesus paid for your salvation is the Holy Spirit living inside of you, changing you from the inside out. And there will be a deposit of Jesus' sorry, righteousness in your account. You won't be able to fully realize that transaction of, of Jesus' righteousness in your account until you reach heaven's shores, but it will be worth it all. And you may be in this room hearing this for the first time, that you never realized that you had a debt right when you were born. You never realized that that sin debt happened right as you were born. And this may be the first time that you have realized that you need to be made new. But you've known that something is missing from your life. And no one can force you to make this decision. It's up to you. But let me tell you something today that I want you to remember. Tomorrow is not promised to anyone. 
But Jesus offers the promise of your tomorrow to anyone. I want to repeat that in case my mic wasn't on. Here we go. Tomorrow is not promised to anyone, but Jesus offers the promise of tomorrow to anyone. Friends, I want you to experience what it means to be alive in Christ. That's what we see in verse 11. Being made alive. See, the defeat of sin will be placed in your account if you trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior. I'm curious, uh, anyone here from the South? Okay, all right. I have a few hands here. So uh, in some of the versions here, it actually says in verse 11, reckon. Um, so I know you maybe like that word in the South. Maybe I just watch TV too much. I don't know. I reckon. Is that something that's said in the South? Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Carol. But in this sense, though, it's not an I reckon. It is in the sense of, not, it's not maybe or possible. In this sense, it is being put into one's account. So when the Bible talks about riches, I'll give you a few examples. Glorious riches in Philippians 4.19. Riches and treasures in 1 Timothy 6. And the riches, and hum, riches of the humble and God-fearers in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 4. Those type of riches are not talking about dollar amounts. They're not even talking about Bitcoin. They are talking about eternal rewards. And we have already listed to you a number of eternal rewards today. Forgiveness of sin, new life, power over sin, freedom, a promise of a resurrected body, eternal life. That's just to name a few. And we're at the end of our passage, and it's telling you another eternal reward, and that is that Jesus will make you alive. See, your sin upon your faith in Jesus Christ has been put to death, and you are made alive. Friends, without Jesus Christ in your heart and life, it is like you are stranded in the ocean, waiting for a lifeline, waving your hands, waiting for someone to save you, struggling for your spiritual health. And Jesus is that lifeline. Jesus is your Savior. He wants to save you. He wants to give you new life. He wants to give you a new purpose. He wants to give you a new future. He wants to give you eternal life. You may be still stranded in that ocean just waving your hands and, and hoping for a hope and joy and a peace and you're not finding it and you just need to turn to the Savior and you'll find it there. To be made new by trusting in Jesus Christ as your Savior and for your sins to be forgiven. I want to close with this. This is a uh, picture of Versova Beach in Mumbai. And this is in the summer of 2016. In the summer of 2016, there was 13 million pounds of trash on the seashores. So much so that they measured in portions of the beach and the, tr the trash was five and a half feet tall. That means that if you could not swim, even before you got to the sea, you could drown in trash. That's how bad it was. Well, there was a man named Afraz Shah who, who saw this and, and he said, that's enough. And he began the effort of what was called the world's largest cleanup. The United Nations uh, recognized this as Shaw began to clean and eventually was joined by 1,000 or so volunteers. And in about a year's time, this is what the beach looked like. And because of his efforts, the UN actually awarded Shaw with a Champions of the Earth Award. Now imagine, I want you to imagine for me, that every sin that was in your life was, was written on a, a bottle, a plastic bottle. And those plastic bottles were, were strewn across the, the seashore. 
And you were asked to, to clean up all of that trash by yourself. And maybe you have great work ethic and you decided to try to clean that all up yourself. And, and maybe you just made a, a small dent in that. And, and you know what, what would happen? You would get a little pride in what you just did. And guess what would happen? More bottles would be on to the seashore and you would be back where you started. See, so you must be completely clean, holy, righteous for you to reach the shores of heaven. And, and, and does that look like a clean slate to you? I mean, if someone asked you to clean that all up yourself, and it was one man that made the difference too, but not just any man, the Son of God came to save us. He came from heaven. He got his hands and feet dirty on this earth. And every one of those sins was placed on Jesus Christ on that cross. And he died for them. And you might say, you don't even realize the amount of trash that is in my life, the, the mess that I've gotten in. There is no way that all of that can be forgiven. Well, let me ask you this question. Do you want to continue to live that way? If, if you knew that there was an answer to that, if you knew that it could be cleaned up, if you knew that all of that mess could be forgiven, don't you want that? Because you will never reach heaven's shores until that is cleaned up. And you cannot clean it up on your own, no matter how hard you might try. You must repent of your sins, ask forgiveness, trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior, and He will wipe away your sins and provide you with the righteousness that you need to enter heaven's shores. Jesus, through his death and resurrection, can make you new. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Before we pray, I'm going to ask that we all bow our heads and close our eyes. I want to ask you this. Do you want to go from death to life? On Easter, do you want to trust in Jesus Christ as your Savior to be saved, to be forgiven, to be given new life? If that is you with all the heads bowed and eyes closed, if that's you, would you just raise your hand and share that with me? I, and just share with me. I, yes, I want to trust in Jesus Christ as my Savior. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you for sharing that with me. Amen. Anyone else that would like to share that with me so I can pray for you? If you'd like to have your life made new by Jesus Christ, raise your hand and share that with me so I can pray for you. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. Well, in a moment, I'm going to pray for you. But if you did raise your hand, I know that took some boldness to do so. Please, if you would, come talk to one of our prayer counselors that's here by the piano after the service. One of your pastors would love to talk to you, or maybe someone that brought you here today. We want you to be sure that you have eternal life in Jesus Christ, and so that he can wipe away all of your sins and give you new life, give you freedom, and be made alive. He can do that. So please, don't leave here without praying that and making that decision in your heart and in your soul. And you can do that right now in your seat, or you can do that with someone who brought you here today. Let me pray for you. Father, I first want to pray for everyone that raised their hand today, that you have opened up their heart and their mind and their soul to you and their need to be forgiven and their need to be made new. Help them, Lord, to to pray to you and ask forgiveness for their sins, to trust in you, to be saved today. Help them to pray that prayer with their heart of hearts. Help them to find someone that they might pray with them or to pray on their own. Father, help them to be a child of God today. 
Thank you for their boldness to be willing to share that. I pray, Lord, you bless them for it. Give them boldness again to, to pray that prayer, to pray that they would trust in you as their Savior. Father, we are so thankful that you can make us new. We have done so much wrong against you, but that you would wipe away that sin through the death of Jesus Christ. And Jesus, that you might raise from the dead to prove that we can have new life in you. What a blessing that is. And we pray that anyone here that does not know you, that they would trust in you today. We love you so very much. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, thank you for joining us. I hope you felt welcome and challenged by God's word and were blessed by our time in worship. At Memorial Baptist Church, we strive to invite people to know and follow Christ. And our YouTube channel is one of the ways we do just that. So please feel free to subscribe down below and share it with others. If you'd like to learn more about NBC, visit our website at nbconline.org. And if you'd like to give to our ministries here at Memorial, there's a link below to do just that as well. We hope to see you again soon.